Thank you very much, uh, Harris, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to share with you some of the research that uh, we've been doing on the effects of caffeine and specifically exploring how individual genetic differences uh, can explain some of the different kinds of responses that we see. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to start by thanking the, uh, the organizers for this invitation. Uh, by way of disclosures, I uh, am the founder and, chair and hold shares in Nutrigenomics, which is a genetic testing company uh, for personalized nutrition. Uh, not a direct-to-consumer like a 23andMe, but only for healthcare professionals. And as related to this topic, one of the uh, tests that we have on our panel uh, is CYP1A2, which affects caffeine metabolism uh, and affects recommendations for uh, caffeine. So one of the questions that I often get by more, I guess, traditional and nutritional scientists is why bother with genetics and genomics? <clears throat> one of the nice things about being a speaker after the break is you have an opportunity to tweak some of your slides based on previous speakers. And I just want to emphasize that if we look at basically any nutritional factor and any health outcome, we know that if there have been enough observational studies, we tend to see this heterogeneity of response in terms of the studies that are published. Uh, so you pick your nutritional exposure, you pick your health outcome. If there have been enough observational studies, you see these apparent inconsistencies. Now there are many reasons uh, for some of those inconsistencies, issues around study design, many of which uh, Dr. Peck has covered nicely. But one of the factors, of course, that's often overlooked is the genetics of the population uh, that's being investigated. So our interest is to try to identify genetic subgroups that might help us predict whether or not the nutritional exposure will increase the risk of the outcome, have no effect, or may actually have uh, the opposite effect. <clears throat> so clearly, you know, one size does not fit all. And I think all of us here recognize that, uh, but it's important to recognize that one of those reasons for that, uh, for those differences, is individual genetic variation. Uh, and so again, I was able to uh, fortunately tweak some of my slides and actually add this one after uh, listening to the, this morning's session. Uh, and again, I think Dr. Peck covered a lot of uh, excellent issues around um, the epidemiology linking caffeine to pretty much any health outcome. And so one of the benefits or uh, outcomes of incorporating genetic variation into a population-based study is that it helps us address some of the limitations that are inherent in nutritional epidemiological studies. So if we look at some of the issues, and again, Dr. Peck covered these nicely uh, just before the break. <clears throat> Recall bias in a case control study. Anyone diagnosed with any kind of health condition uh, is prone to perhaps recollecting uh, things slightly differently, and this is a well-established phenomenon. Uh, we heard about issues around uh, measurement exposure, a lot depending on the dietary um, instrument or tool that one uses, whether it's food records that could be a um, heavy kind of burden on the participants, or a food frequency questionnaire which might lack some major sources of a particular exposure. Uh, those can all contribute to um, errors in uh, measuring exposure, resulting in misclassification. So putting someone in a category where they don't actually belong because we weren't able to accurately assess what they're exposed to. <clears throat> Residual confounding, uh, again, another well-known um, challenge in nutritional epidemiology. We know that heavy coffee drinkers or heavy users of caffeine um, are different in many characteristics. Uh, they're more likely to be smokers, more likely to have uh, poor dietary habits and other potential confounders. Now, we can adjust for those confounders as much as we can, uh, but there's always that possibility that there's something else that 
heavy coffee drinkers or consumers of caffeine do that abstainers or those who drink in moderation don't do. And it's quite possible that we just never measured those uh, other exposures. <clears throat> so quite possibly heavy consumption of caffeine or coffee could be uh, a surrogate measure of some other exposure that we just weren't aware of or didn't take into account. So it's always possible that if you're linking caffeine consumption in an observational study, right, not like in an RCT design, it's quite possible that the effects you see are confounded by something else that you just did not measure. And so that's what we refer to as residual confounding. Um, a lot of food sources like coffee and tea are fairly complex mixtures of all kinds of phytochemicals. So the question is, is it the caffeine or is it something else? And again, using genetics and genomics can help us pinpoint the specific bioactive that might be responsible. And finally, it can also help us elucidate the molecular mechanisms of action. So I'll give you an example of some of the work that we've been doing uh, and then kind of go back to this list. And you'll be able to see that by incorporating genetics into a, um, an observational study, we can basically cross off these issues as being uh, concerns. So uh, this is just the chemical structure of caffeine. And as we've already heard, many of us have acquired a liking for caffeine. Uh, I'm sure many of you wouldn't be here this morning if it wasn't for caffeine. This might be your preferred method of administration, perhaps. Obviously, recent concerns have centered around energy drinks and their use and consumption among uh, children and adolescents. And um, obviously, this uh, has been something that the FDA has uh, begun to look into. Uh, there was a report uh, just a few months ago uh, based, uh, it was basically a press release out of the American Heart Association conference showing a disproportionate number of calls uh, to, to poison centers related to energy drinks among children. And as you can see here near the bottom, uh, most of them focus on uh, cardiovascular and neurological symptoms. So I just want to focus on the cardiovascular effects. So in addition to those, uh, there have obviously been a number of case reports of uh, not only premature death among adolescents consuming energy drinks and oftentimes engaging in some form of physical activity. Uh, this was a case report in The Lancet uh, where a child uh, was admitted to the emergency uh, department with uh, tachycardia, heart racing, uh, and uh, elevated blood pressure. Uh, and it turned out he had just consumed two packs of uh, gum that contains caffeine, and the total amount was something in the order of 400 milligrams. Uh, and so once that was identified, and it was, uh, and he had never consumed it before, uh, so again, maybe not a direct cause, but another example of the cardiovascular effects of even a dose of 400 milligrams that it can have on a child. Uh, obviously, energy drinks are increasing in popularity, particularly among uh, the youth and adolescents. This is just one example. Don't mean to pick on it, but just to illustrate the fact that the marketing um, is tailored to kind of you know, risk-taking behavior among uh, children. Uh, if you can't see the top, it says the legal alternative. It's spelled in white powder there. Uh, this little can of cocaine has 280 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, and so this was actually taken off the shelves of 7-Eleven stores a number of years ago, but just illustrates uh, how um, some of these products are, are being uh, marketed to children. Uh, and as much as some of the manufacturers of energy drinks uh, have taken steps to um, avoid marketing their products to children, some of them continue to do so. Uh, this was a slide that was sent to me by uh, Jim Shepard, who uh, lost his son uh, when he was 15 years old, and he had his first energy drink, and he engaged in some physical activity, uh, and then the following day, um, uh, he died of uh, cardiovascular complications. Uh, so this is just uh, an example of some material that Red Bull provides to high school students when they graduate, and many of them are, are under the age of 18, of course, some of them 16, 17 years old. Uh, and as you know, Red Bull's, uh, sorry, Red Bull's mo motto is uh, 
Red Bull gives you wings, and now that you've graduated, um, you can spread your wings and drink Red Bull. Globally, however, coffee is still the biggest source of caffeine, as we heard uh, earlier this, uh, this morning. Uh, I think some estimates suggest that coffee is the second most widely traded commodity after oil. Uh, and a cup of coffee is no longer just a cup of coffee. Uh, recently, Tim Hortons changed the names of their cups of coffee. So at the end, what used to be a small is now an extra small. Uh, and they basically just introduced this extra large coffee, which has 24 ounces. So clearly, we're, we, we, um, you know, a cup of coffee is not just a cup, and it's important to take into account these different cup sizes when conducting observational studies and asking people how many cups of coffee you drink. Some might say, oh, I just drink one cup a day. But it's this 24-ounce cup that they chug. Now, this might be a little bit controversial, and, and some of you may disagree. Um, first of all, caffeine is caffeine. The chemical structure is identical no matter where you find it. Uh, but the reason why I say caffeine from energy drinks is not equivalent to caffeine from uh, coffee is because I think it's important to look at the pharmacokinetics and how these different products are consumed. Right? So a hot beverage that's sipped slowly over time, uh, even the same equivalent dose uh, will lead to differences in peak plasma concentrations compared to uh, a cold beverage that's often chugged over a much shorter period of time. Right? So it's just basic pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, right? So we know that it's the peak plasma concentrations that can cause some of the adverse effects because there's spillover from the receptors that they typically bind to, and then they start binding to other receptors that may cause some of, the, some of these adverse effects. All right, so now going back to coffee and cardiovascular disease, uh, of course, there have been dozens and dozens of studies looking at this association, and not surprisingly, results have been all over the map. Uh, some recent studies that suggest a decreased effect show this U-shaped or a J-shaped association, suggesting that moderate consumption might lower your risk, but as you increase consumption, risk starts to go up. So our interest, of course, was into uh, trying to identify particular genes that could explain some of these inconsistencies. Uh, now, when we look at a cup of coffee, uh, as I mentioned, it's a fairly complex beverage. Uh, metabolomics analyses of, of uh, different varieties of coffee have identified hundreds of bioactives. Uh, some of them, like the polyphenols that have antioxidant properties, might be beneficial while others, like the diterpenoids that are known to raise LDL cholesterol, might be um, detrimental. So it's a mixture of some good things and some not so good things. Uh, our interest, of course, is uh, and, and was in caffeine. And we asked the question, is caffeine a component in coffee that might uh, contribute to cardiovascular disease? Uh, so you, you saw earlier this morning, um, Harris covered nicely the metabolism of caffeine uh, and its basically detoxified or broken down primarily by CYP1A2 in the liver. Uh, and this enzyme catalyzes the rate-limiting detoxification or breakdown of caffeine, converting it into more water-soluble paraxanthine that's then broken down into other water-soluble compounds. So at least 80% uh, goes in this pathway. And as you heard earlier, uh, theobromine and theophylline are other metabolites as well. Now, if you look at uh, the gene that codes for this enzyme, there is a common polymorphism uh, at this position that has a profound effect on enzyme activity or uh, inducibility as shown here on the y-axis. So if you, are a, uh, if you are homozygous for the A allele, that means you inherited the A allele both from your mother and your father, you have basically a four-fold higher rate of breaking down caffeine compared to a carrier of the C allele. So if you have even one copy of the non-inducible C allele, we can classify you as basically a slow metabolizer. Now, we reason that if caffeine is a component in coffee that might trigger a heart attack, we would expect the slow metabolizers to be at a higher risk, right? Because they're less efficient at breaking down and eliminating caffeine from their system. If it's going to cause any adverse effects, it'll be in those individuals 
as opposed to the fast metabolizers who get rid of it quite efficiently. So it's quite possible that four cups of coffee for one individual might be the equivalent biological dose as one cup of coffee for somebody else. So while in epidemiological studies we just ask you know, how many cups of coffee have you drank, we don't typically take into account how much of that caffeine sticks around in their system and reaches the target cell of interest, and that's an important consideration. It's a way of basically doing an internal or biological stratification of dose. Now, at one point we thought that perhaps the slow metabolizers just drink less caffeine. Right? We heard again this morning that uh, I think Richard mentioned people generally self-titrate or self-regulate how much caffeine based on the balance of positive effects and kind of minimizing the adverse effects of jitteriness and anxiety and that sort of thing. Uh, it turns out there was no difference in how much caffeine the fast and slow metabolizers consumed. And in hindsight, that's not really surprising because what we feel when we consume a caffeinated beverage is when caffeine binds to the adenosine receptor, the A2A receptor, which is the primary target of the stimulatory effects of caffeine in the central nervous system. So we can't just feel how much caffeine is floating around in our blood. So in fact, we did show, uh, and we reported this a number of years ago in AJCN, that a variation or a polymorphism in the adenosine A2A receptor does predict uh, habitual caffeine consumption. And this was the first evidence of a genetic determinant of habitual caffeine consumption. So we conducted uh, our, to test the hypothesis that slow metabolizers might be at a higher risk of heart disease uh, with increasing coffee consumption. Uh, we tested this using a case control study, and this was in collaboration with Hanya Campos at Harvard. We looked at just over 2,000 cases of an acute myocardial infarction and an equal number of controls. Uh, we used a food frequency questionnaire to assess caffeine consumption. Uh, and again, I think we heard earlier issues around different types of, of dietary instruments. Um, when you do these validation studies comparing a food frequency questionnaire to food records and other, you know, so-called gold standard, um, and you look at the correlation coefficients, coffee is leagues above every other component in, in the questionnaire. Most people know if they consume one cup a day, four cups a day, or no cups a day. So you get correlation coefficients of over 0.8. So while an FFQ might not be the best instrument for assessing things like you know, total fat consumption, it's actually a very good tool for assessing uh, coffee intake. Uh, this study was done in Costa Rica where over 90% of the caffeine came from coffee. So we did take into account some of the other sources, tea and cola beverages, uh, and they didn't really alter our findings significantly. Now, before taking genetics into account, when we just looked at the association between coffee and uh, the risk of a myocardial infarction, uh, we see that the multivariate adjusted odds ratio, so this is adjusting for smoking, physical activity, saturated fat, a whole host of potential confounders. Uh, we found that those who drank four or more cups a day had a 36% increased risk of a heart attack. And this was statistically significant. Now the real question we asked or wanted to ask is, is this increased risk due to caffeine? And if it is due to caffeine, we would expect the slow metabolizers to be at a higher risk. So when we stratified our population by fast or slow metabolizers, that's exactly what we found. That among the fast metabolizers on the left-hand side, you see absolutely no increased risk. If anything, you see signs of this U-shaped association, right, suggesting moderate consumption might actually be protective. Whereas the slow metabolizers, even two to three cups a day, is now associated with a higher risk. And just going back one slide, the reason why we didn't see anything with two to three cups a day with the entire population is because that's a mixture of the fast metabolizers that seem to be protected versus the slow metabolizers that seem to have a higher risk. So when you put those two groups together, you would conclude incorrectly that coffee has absolutely no, no, uh, no effect. Now I should mention here that in, the, in our population, 50% were slow metabolizers and the other half, of course, fast metabolizers. So we're not talking about a trivial 
two or five percent of the population, we're talking half. So certainly from a statistical point of view, that also gives us greater power when we do these types of stratifications. Now, there was evidence to believe at the time that caffeine might act as a trigger for a heart attack, more so among younger cases. And so when we looked at those below the median age of 50, you can see that the y-axis now changes. Slow metabolizers that drink four more cups a day had almost a four-fold increased risk of a heart attack. And as you can see with the fast metabolizers, even moderate consumption was now associated with a significant uh, protective effect. And so what we think might be happening with the fast metabolizers is because they can efficiently get rid of the caffeine that might not be so good, uh, that might unmask some of the beneficial effects of the polyphenols and the other goodies that are found in a cup of coffee. Now, once you reach four or more cups a day, even though you're a fast metabolizer, you're probably starting to saturate the system so that the adverse effects of caffeine are starting to counter any beneficial effects of whatever else is found in, in coffee. Now, I should mention that the only difference between these four cup a day drinkers on the right hand side and the four cup a day drinkers on the left hand side is a single nucleotide polymorphism that affects the rate of caffeine metabolism. They smoke the same, physical activity levels are the same, just about every variable in our database that we looked at is the same. And that's not surprising because we don't expect that uh, genetic difference that affects the metabolism of caffeine and a bunch of other drugs and, and other exposures would influence your likelihood of uh, being more physically active or adopting some adverse health uh, lifestyle. So this whole issue of confounding really doesn't alter these results. Right? Because whatever the four cup a day drinkers are doing that are slow metabolizers, the four cup a day drinkers that are fast metabolizers are probably doing the same thing too. So again, it eliminates this idea of, of uh, residual confounding. Same thing with recall bias. Right? If on the right hand side we think that the cases overestimated their caffeine consumption, well, the heavy coffee drinkers are just as likely to have the slow metabolizer as they are to have the fast metabolizer. So the whole issue of recall bias is no longer uh, an issue as well. Uh, so we reported this in JAMA a number of years ago, uh, and it's the kind of thing that the media likes to report on. This was the front page of the London Times in the UK, why two cups of coffee can damage your heart. And the headline on the inside was, gene that could make your next coffee your last. This is what sells newspapers. It wasn't until a couple of years later that another group uh, in Italy essentially replicated our findings, but instead of looking at risk of a heart attack, they looked at the risk of developing hypertension, which we had postulated was an intermediary pathway. So caffeine causes spikes in blood pressure, can increase the risk of hypertension, and ultimately could lead to myocardial infarction. And this was actually a prospective study. So they looked at a bunch of prehypertensives, assessed their coffee intake, genotyped them, and then followed them to see who developed hypertension. <clears throat> and they found very similar uh, results. Their cup sizes, this was a study based in Italy, are slightly different. Uh, but as you can see on the left-hand side, fast metabolizers are protected, lower risk of developing hypertension, whereas the slow metabolizers have an increased risk. When they combined these together, they concluded that caffeine, or sorry, coffee has absolutely no link to hypertension. And there are a number of studies that, that demonstrate that. But as you can see clearly, it really depends on that internal stratification of dose. Comparing those who get rid of it very efficiently versus those where it actually lingers in the system longer and could have adverse effects. They also looked at the effects of uh, catecholamines and on the left hand side they, they found that the slow metabolizers that drink four or more cups a day have higher levels of epinephrine, um, borderline higher levels of norepinephrine. And because epinephrine is metabolized by uh, COMT or catechomethyltransferase, it was interesting to see this other study that was published a number of years ago looking at those who have the LL genotype of COMT, those individuals have an impaired ability to metabolize epinephrine. 
right? And so it lingers in the system longer, and those who consume higher amounts of coffee and have an impaired ability to get rid of epinephrine have the highest risk of acute coronary events. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we reported in uh, Journal of Caffeine Research that individuals with this genotype who consume at least 200 milligrams a day have almost a threefold higher uh, risk of reporting increased um, a heart rate, which could explain some of these adverse cardiovascular effects in individuals who cannot get rid of epinephrine as efficiently, which caffeine is known to stimulate. So how do we balance the advice then that we give to individuals with public health recommendations? Uh, well, many of the recommendations, certainly by Health Canada and others, set the limit at 400 milligrams a day, and we know that uh, certainly if you're a fast metabolizer, that's okay. Uh, but as you can see, with the slow metabolizers, even uh, two to three cups a day, anything more than 200 milligrams, could increase the risk of heart attack and hypertension. Now, obviously, individuals would have to know what their genetics uh, is in order to make this kind of information useful. You can't just tell people if you're a slow metabolizer, this is what your recommendation should be. Uh, this was uh, an article that was published in the uh, Sacramento Bee after a conference at UC Davis on personalized nutrition. Uh, where, again, I think the public is becoming uh, more and more exposed to uh, genomic information and with companies like 23andMe that are making this kind of information uh, <clears throat> readily available, uh, individuals will be seeking this information. In fact, it's my last slide, the Institute for the Future had reported over 10 years ago um, that about a third of consumers plan to focus on personalized nutrition and that a sizable segment of the population would be making day-to-day -day decisions on what to eat based on their genetic makeup. This was published 10 years ago, and the speculation was in 10 years' time, which is around now. Uh, and so while we might uh, not be there fully for all aspects of what we consume, there are now some examples of where individuals, based on their genetic um, uh, predispositions, should perhaps be modifying the recommendations. So I'll finish off by thanking some of the members of my lab and some of uh, the funding partners that supported this research, uh, primarily AFMNet and uh, CIHR. And I'll just leave you then with uh, my final slide. This was not my final slide. Well, I've memorized it by now. It's a quote by Hippocrates, uh, and here it is. So uh, even though the science of nutritional genomics is fairly new, the concept, as you can see, is quite ancient. Uh, and he noted over 2,500 years ago that positive health requires knowledge of man's primary constitution. Uh, and that was just an old-fashioned way of saying genotype. Uh, and so clearly we've come a long way, uh, but again, now with the modern tools of genomics, we can better understand how specific genetic variations can impact our, our uh, risk and response to everything we consume. Uh, in terms of future directions in this area, I think a lot more needs to be done to identify different genetic risk profiles, uh, not only for the effects of coffee on cardiovascular disease, but all other health outcomes that uh, have been studied. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We'll take uh, a couple of questions. Brent Kolbush with General Mills. Um, with these studies, have you looked at um, these populations based on their familial genetic makeup of risk of car coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease in the interpretation of these results? So we did. Um ask a question related to family history of heart disease, and that was uh, a variable that was adjusted for in the analyses. When we did stratified analyses between those who had a family history and those who didn't, um, our power was diminished, but we saw similar trends. So it seemed to be over and above whatever your family history uh, might be for heart disease. Uh, yeah, Doug Weed, um, I'm just an epidemiologist consultant. Uh, so, so I, I know you think you've controlled for all the confounders, but how do you control for the confounders you didn't measure in your study? I mean, it's not like they don't, that they may not exist. So, sure. I mean, 
Residual confounding, as you know, is sort of reserved for the notion of a factor that's been measured and then there's still some confounding remaining. That's one issue. But the unmeasured confounders, things you don't know, you cannot have controlled for. So given, even given your results, you didn't eliminate the confounding problem, right? So the example that I give is um, one of the questions we did not ask in our questionnaire is um, yoga going activities, right? Do you do yoga, right? So let's assume that heavy coffee drinkers don't do yoga. And we know that yoga is associated with calmness and a lower risk of, of heart disease. So if the heavy coffee drinkers who are slow metabolizers, who have a higher risk of a heart attack, if, if heavy coffee drinking is a measure or is being confounded by not going to yoga, then so would the heavy coffee drinkers who are fast metabolizers, right? Because that gene cannot biologically predict yoga going activity or it doesn't influence it. How, how do you know that? I because mean, you're, you're arguing that the genetics can, can predict cardiovascular disease due to the caffeine. How do you know it doesn't predict yoga exercise? I mean, how do you know that? You can say that, and we can assume that it sounds right, but do sure. you know that? Sure. No, absolutely. One could draw a link between the CYP1A2 and some other exposure that might influence your physical activity or, or predilection for engaging in exactly. physical activity. But we did look at all of the variables in our database, just about every single no, variable. No, I, I appreciate that. I'm talking about the unmeasured sure. contenders. I'm just sort of putting Absolutely. this in context. Sure. I'm, okay, that's good. Here Thank you. Uh, one more question. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm John O'Brien. I work for Nestle. Um, referring back to a, to a slide of uh, Dr. Lieberman's uh, on the stability of caffeine intake over time in individuals, um, are there, I, and I guess the point I'm making is that caffeine is not like other food constituents in the fact that it, now, it announces its presence to the consumer through physiological effects. Now, in that respect then, to what extent are fast and slow metabolizers aware of their rate of metabolism? Are there behavioral studies on the different uh, phenotypes which reflect their capacity to metabolize ca caffeine? And, and to what extent is that protective of those individuals? Right. It's a, a great question. And um, oftentimes after a talk, someone will say to me, oh, I, 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 I know I'm definitely a slow metabolizer. So if I drink a cup of coffee in the afternoon, it keeps me up at night. Well, chances are you have a polymorphism in the adenosine receptor. So caffeine binds more tightly and causes that stimulating effect and, and, and alertness. We did look, uh, we administered a number of uh, uh, cave caffeine habits questionnaires. We asked questions around the acute effects of caffeine, what do you experience after, you know, within a few hours of consuming a caffeinated beverage, some beneficial uh, effects, some adverse effects that were mixed in the questionnaire. We also asked people, if you don't get a caffeinated beverage between 24 and 48 hours, what kinds of withdrawal symptoms do you experience? And none of those seem to be linked to CYP1A2 genotype. We do know that there probably is a genetic uh, predictor of some of the acute behavioral effects of caffeine, as well as the type and severity of withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and we're about to do some genome-wide studies to try to identify some of those. But currently, we know that this gene does not predict any of those behavioral outcomes.